go, go. So, um, yeah. Just, just introduce it and then I'll close the lightning talks. Okay, great. Um, my name is Mitch Altman and uh, uh, this is kind of ad hoc, but uh, a few of us are going to talk about geeks and depression and suicide. This is a fantastically uplifting part, a way to end uh, 28C3 in the lightning talks. But we're actually going to make it, uh, at least I'm going to introduce it as something uh, worthwhile and maybe even a little entertaining. Uh, the thing is, um, yeah. Just, uh, just let me close the lightning talks. Oh, so Nick's going to close the lightning talks, and uh, we're going to have, I'm going to have a, a, a few slides, and then uh, Christine's going to talk, and then uh, um, Jimmy, and then Meredith and Christine and Jimmy and I will have a little conversation. The thing is, uh, depression is actually a big, big thing in uh, our community, so I hope you'll stick around and Nick will now close the lightning talks. Okay, yeah. Um, this is a session that, that I, that's important to me, and so we have some time, and that's why I'm going to allow Mitch um, and his panelists uh, to do that. But the lightning talks are now officially over. Give everybody a huge round of applause. Uh, I'm, I'm really, really sorry that uh, we couldn't get to all of the Lightning Talk presenters, um, but I really hope that you'll stick around for this presentation because I, I believe it's really important and topical, and I'm going to hand it back to Mitch, and while he's running through his slides, we're going to get the table, try to silently set up the table for the panel. Is that okay? Yeah, totally cool. Okay. okay. So, um, do I have slides? Uh... Oh, So I'm, I'm going to recycle some slides that I did for a presentation uh, a while back for Ignite, uh, where I uh, told the story of how I went from a depressed blob of a kid to being uh, a person who actually loves my life. Um, I, 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 sorry, Mitch, can you run them off your laptop? Uh, I can, yeah. Okay, yeah, I, didn't, I didn't manage to get it. I, I apologize for that. Yeah, no problem. Great. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, most people uh, who know me think that I'm a happy person, and I am. I totally love my life, but I didn't start off my life that way. And, uh, oh, Michael's here. Do you want to be part of this, too? Like, uh, yeah, great. So, um, yeah, I started off my life way totally depressed and actually went uh, from being someone who had no clue how to live or enjoy anything to being someone who, you know, loves my life. And um, as a result, I've been able to empathize with a lot of people who suffer from depression and, um, you know, help people with their journey in life. And I'm really, really happy I can do that. Uh, one of the things that spurred uh, this talk is a friend of mine, Ilya, uh, killed himself last month. And I don't know if any of you in the audience, I'm sure a lot of you in the audience actually know someone you felt close to killed themselves, because I recognize some people who have had that experience. It sucks. It fucking sucks. There's nothing you can do about it. Um, but there is something you can do in your life. And one of the things I did to cope is uh, start discussion groups um, uh, in San Francisco and encouraging others around uh, the world in geek communities to talk about depression and suicide. And I wrote a very personal blog post that went viral. And I got hundreds of emails from people thanking me for putting out that blog post. And um, it was really clear that not only me when I was a little kid, afraid to tell people I was depressed, but lots of people now suffering depression are afraid to tell other people they're depressed, and they even think that it's safer to kill themselves than to reach out for help, which is incredibly sad. So if we can uh, create a, an environment where it's just a little bit less unsafe, maybe someone can reach out rather than harm themselves and live another day and do amazingly cool things with their lives and make our world a little bit better place as a result. So that, that's my intent uh, for all of this. And um, 
You probably know people who are very depressed who you don't know they're depressed. I bet, I bet you all do. So, um, well, let me run through uh, just a few slides. Uh, you know, I actually do love my job and my life, and it's really a huge part of our society that people don't love their work. Uh, how many people here don't like their job? Wow, this is a great community here. We do stuff that we love, but uh, according to the internet, 80% of people don't like their work, especially in the US. Uh, but uh, my name is Mitch Altman. I turn TVs off for a living, and I love my job. <laughs> so, um, yeah, of course. So, you know, and uh, like I said, um, you can, too. If, if I can go through what I went through and learn to love my life, anyone can. Uh, I didn't start off my life, though, um, loving my life. I started off my life totally depressed, propelled there by bullies who beat me up for being an introverted geek, gay, fat, bad at sports. And parents and teachers were absolutely no help at all, and life was total hell. So when I went home, I. I retreated into the magical world of television where everyone was beautiful, had loving parents, supportive friends, where all of these uh, problems were resolved at the end of a half an hour. It was incredibly depressing. So I only retreated more into television, uh, becoming more of a target at school, only to come back home to retreat into television again, which I call addiction. Can you say addiction? Um, but there are many other ways of uh, avoiding oneself, even things that later became positive in my life, like geeking out, I could do at home. Electronics, which is my thing, is not abusive. The parts do what they're told. But it's all, and you can do such cool things, but it's also solo. And it's another way of just retreating inward and not dealing with other people. So these pluses and minuses with all these things. And also travel. My parents did this U.S middle-class travel ritual, which is stuffing the whole family in a station wagon and calling it a vacation. But um, from that, I learned uh, that travel actually has some cool things, but can also be used as an escape. And I have to talk about pot, because it saved my life. In my high school, all you had to do was smoke pot and you were considered cool. And then I found out I could actually enjoy hanging out with other kids. They did not only not beat me up, but we could hang out and be silly and it was fun. Uh, but of course, it has its downsides and I abused the hell out of it. Work is another way of avoiding oneself, and I learned that from my workaholic father who retreated from all the problems in our family into his work. And I started doing that in all of my jobs, because that was the example set for my father. And, um, you know, I was working in a, a, a job in a town that I really hated, a closet case, addicted to TV, addicted to pot, addicted to all these things that I was avoiding myself, and I chose all of those things. Choice is incredibly powerful. Choice allows us to do what we hate, it allows us to do what we like, it allows us to do what we love. And by making a choice the first time in my life of quitting that job and moving away from that town that I hated, it was the first time in my life that I could make a choice for me. Make a choice for what I thought might be good for me, rather than making a choice of what I thought other people wanted of me. Making choices for what I thought other people wanted from me is absolutely absurd. Because I didn't even know what I want. How am I supposed to think what other people want of me? But when I started making choices for what I thought I wanted, then I made many mistakes. But I started learning from the mistakes and making new choices so that I could have a process that I'm still on and I will be on until I die of learning from my mistakes, learning from my successes, learning from my choices, and making new choices as a result. That led me to doing TV Be Gone. It led me going to hacker space, uh, hacker conferences, which led me to start hacker spaces and helping other hacker spaces and doing all these incredible things that I love and helping people any way I can. So I do want to say that um, uh, I, um, uh, I thought I had my contact information here. I guess I don't. But uh, if anyone wants to contact me for any reason ever, please do. My email is mitch at cornfieldelectronics.com and you can find me easily online or at any cool hacker conference in the world that I can go to. 
So um, that's about uh, all I want to say for introducing this topic. Um, and Jimmy is going to speak, uh, oh no, Christine is going to speak next. So you have some slides too. So here. Sorry. Are we still actually streaming? Here we go. Okay, great. Give a round of applause for Christina. Thank you. Hi. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. So I've been involved with this uh, geeks and depression thing with Mitch for uh, a few weeks. And it's important to me in particular um, from the standpoint of depression as it relates to abuse and trauma and how one survives in the world um, after having a severely traumatic experience. Um, first, I'd like to say, like, many of us are here because we're different. We don't fit in wherever we grew up or in the families that we had and we feel this difference very acutely. And e even if it doesn't manifest very obviously as trauma, often it manifests as social ostracization or um, like j just the knowing that you're different and having people behave that way towards you. Um, and it manifests as depression. We are social animals. Um, we want the comfort of others. And then we put barriers up because we're not getting that comfort. We're just getting pain and we guard ourselves, our emotional vulnerabilities. Um, people who have survived long-term abuse are even farther removed from being able to connect socially with others. Um, we don't have a paradigm to draw on of any kind of positive interaction. We just have a cycle of pain and reaction and defense. And as a result, we are often misunderstood by others. We often clash with other people. Um, and end up continuing that cycle just by accident. Um, the mental health profile of a trauma survivor will differ drastically from most other people. Hypervigilance is one of the biggest ones. Um, we are on alert constantly for signs of aggression and potential pain because we're used to that. Um, we're not able to communicate very well with other people um, or communicate in a way that makes sense to normal people. Um, we can execute defensive actions preemptively, strike first when perceiving a situation of high personal risk, um, whether it's emotional or physical, um, using offensive action as a defense. Um, often we just straight up hide what we're feeling, um, look happy, fake happiness, fake being okay with being where we are just to make sure that nobody can hurt us. Um, there's also a phenomenon called triggers where certain input will basically trigger a full sensory memory of a, tree, of a previous traumatic event and then that event is re-experienced and reacted to in the present moment and often it's a layering of the first traumatic event and then all of the subsequent previous trauma. Um, when under stress, like, we can exhibit strange behavior, shut down, become nonverbal, um, become incredibly conflict-oriented, often can become a completely different person. Uh, and of course, prone to passive or active suicidal ideation, we can dream about killing ourselves or getting out of the world or not being there anymore because it seems like the only way out. Abuse and trauma often happens to children and children can't protect themselves. Um, Parents and family members are often the ones who perpetrate abuse. Um, and there's no way to escape from that kind of abuse because it is your parent. It is the person that you're dependent on. It's your guardian. It's somebody that you trust. And 
when somebody that you trust hurts you, when you don't understand how to pick apart whether or not you should trust somebody, that can, it basically permanently changes your worldview on how to trust people and how to interact. Um, there can be physical abuse, there can be um, hitting, beating, cutting, burning, withholding food or nourishment, confinement, um, emotional abuse via manipulation, reward punishment systems, personal devaluing, statements of worth, forced or coercive sexual abuse. Um, nuclear family structure is a huge point of failure. What is that? Okay. Um, because the nuclear family structure is so um, so inter is children can't really alert somebody that something is wrong because of nuclear family structure because if they try and go outside um, they will generally be disbelieved not taken seriously abuse can result in all of these different personality disorders most often post-traumatic stress disorder or borderline personality disorder sufferers of depression are told to reach out it is difficult or impossible for abuse survivors to reach out it often seems like the only way out the only way to end the constant pain. And often we don't know um, if somebody wants to help us, we have no way to communicate that we want help. And we get together at cons, we get together at hackathons, everybody's having fun, everybody's like doing something constructive and we can often feel that we are the only ones feeling sad, feeling anything negative. Um, for me personally, I have had a very traumatic personal experience. I was abused by my mother and had no way out and had no way to communicate that I was being hurt and then I grew up feeling that this was right and I couldn't communicate to other people what was wrong and I, I got into this situation where other people appear to be doing awesome things and I feel like I'm the only one who feels bad and for a very long time I couldn't reach out as a result. Um, but hacking and our hacker community is our chosen family. I left the family that hurt me to find a family that I wanted to be with. And being a family as well as a community means opening up to each other and supporting each other. And you probably know somebody who is an abuse survivor, but you don't know that he or she was abused. You don't know what they're going through because they don't feel safe telling you. Um, and abuse survivors are often relearning how to interact with the world in a positive way and rewriting their own narrative because they got one that was honestly really shitty. And I am hoping that other people will become aware of the fact that a lot of people do get abused and to learn how to accept each other and to help each other and to be there for each other and to make it safe to say, I was abused, I was hurt, and I would like support from my chosen family. Thanks. Um, hello, my name's uh, Jimmy Rogers. I'm going to keep this fairly short because we're running short on time. But um, I've dealt with depression since I was very young um, due to a lot of issues um, in my life. I mean, that's, depression is always a very personal thing for everybody, so I don't have to specifically go into it. But when I was 16, I tried to end my life. And um, luckily, my mother came home um, just in time, and I had this epiphany um, with a gun in my mouth that my actions would affect the lives of everyone around me. And I was very lucky in having this realization because depression, and specifically suicide, is a very, very, it's a very selfish act. Um, it's about as selfish as you can get. It's not necessarily bad to be selfish in some ways, but it's important to realize how this affects other people. And if it wasn't for this realization, I wouldn't still be here. Um, later in college, one of my friends also, um, he actually managed to kill himself. And 
Um, what I would like to say to everybody is there are people out there that you can speak to. And it's not easy sometimes. Um, you just don't see it or you get into a mode where you're just so apathetic or separated from your body or all of these things. You can get help. Um, there's an unfortunate um, trend with our Western cultures and most cultures that mental health is your problem that you need to deal with and that is completely fucking false. Um, you can get help. There are people to help you. Sometimes medication helps as well. But talk to somebody. Um, I am here anytime. I know any of these panelists are here to talk. And the point of family that got brought up here at this hacker scene is really important because this is also my family. And while I'm not willing to talk about my specific issues here in general, I will absolutely talk to any of you individually if you want to come to me. I'm also a rape survivor, so I've had to deal with some issues with that as well. And I'm willing to talk about that in a very intimate setting, but also not um, publicly for triggering type of issues, but um, please talk to us. We'll put up our contact information. We'll get a slide up with our email addresses, um, usually in a hardware area at a hacker conference near you. Um, but yes, people are here for you. So. Yeah, so, you know, a lot of us have been through some hell in our lives, and uh, us here on this stage are not unique in this way. Um, you know, we just happen to be people who uh, were talking about this and were willing to come up here, and, uh, you know, there's nothing special about us. I wish there were. Um, but this is something uh, huge in our community, so uh, um, we don't really have much time. We have just a few minutes, but uh, one of the things that uh, the three of us mentioned in our own ad hoc speeches is that you know all of us were afraid to reach out to other people and people we know who killed themselves were afraid to reach out to other people so um, this is uh, really the way it is I know when I was a little kid I didn't want to let other people know I was depressed because that just proved that I was as defective as I believed I was um, so did you want to say something uh, Meredith well, I was, I was just going to say um, that was a particularly big issue for, um, for Len, my husband, as well. Um, Len was also struggling with, uh, with disability issues. Um, he was diagnosed with uh, chronic depression when he was 15, um, Crohn's disease at 17, and then in 2006, um, he out of the blue developed a seizure disorder and <laughs> some kind of degenerative spinal condition. I mean, it just got worse and worse and worse. And as somebody who, you know, had been going to conferences and speaking and um, working at PGP, getting into, you know, getting into the crypto program at Kyle Leuven, you know, he felt like it was imperative to maintain this this external facade of competence um, and and just not let on not only what was going on you know emotionally but also what was going on physically um, after after Len killed himself in July, I think the biggest reaction was wait him but but he had the 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 gap that you have to cross over to to reach out and ask for help and i wish he had been able to 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 admit that you know that things were hard because things are fucking hard for all of us and they're hard and they're hard for all of us in different ways but you know the person sitting next to you is struggling with things that they haven't told their friends about but it might actually be easier for them to talk to you because sometimes it's easier to talk to a stranger you know Emerson do you mind if I talk 
about the conversation we had outside for just a second. So I, I barely freaking know Emerson. I, I ran into him like at camp, basically. And we, you know, and I was outside smoking a cigarette and he said, and he, he steps outside. I say, hi, you know, what, what, what are you going to be doing today? Oh, well, I'm going to be going to the Geeks and Depression panel. And he asks, he, you know, he asks me, you know, so what, what, what did happen with Len? And it was actually easier really for me to, 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 to start pouring this stuff out to somebody that, that I don't, that I don't even know very well, but who, but, but who said, look, I'm willing to listen. So, you know, keep, keep that in mind too, because we have good fucking people in this community. We have people who care about who you are. They don't care about the image you put up. They don't care about the shield that separates you from everybody else. They care about who you are deep down. They care about who you are in here and in here. They care about the cool things that you create. They care about the cool things that you bring into the world, but they also care about the person that you are even when you can't. Thanks for that. I want to say something, uh, Michael? Hi. Uh, I'm Michael. I'm from Vienna. Uh, I'm with Mitalab. And um, in regards to reaching out, um, the first step is also realizing, possibly, that you're depressed. For a number of years, I didn't really know uh, that what I was going through was something special like i i just considered the state that i'm in normal and horrible i realized it was horrible but i didn't even like get to the point where i thought like oh i have a problem there's there's something in my head in my heart wherever that i maybe should be talking to someone about it was just not there and it really took years for me to get to the point of like, oh, right, this is, this is what happening, what's happening. And statistically speaking, I seem to be in the bipolar spectrum. So uh, I have episodes where everything is horrible and everyone here, you're a, our community, we're extremely exposed to horrible, horrible details of what's going out there, what's going on out there. So we have this like, special view that a lot of people around us, from apart from our community, don't really understand. So it's this load. And then there is times where also like coming to camp this year, for example, which are so exhilarating and wonderful and emotional that uh, like, yeah, there is extreme highs. So this like understanding in that particular situation where you're at that, hey, maybe uh, like this, complete bliss that I'm right now, I should tone it down a little. And also the, de the depressive episode that, hey, uh, talk to someone, wh wh what's in your head, maybe thinking about like the self-worth issues that you're in right now, uh, that, hey, you're doing cool stuff. Get like, talk to people about what, what you think of them and you'll notice that there's a lot coming back of how people perceive you. And I just had a conversation with someone that's sitting back there yesterday and I was really struggling uh, again with like, fuck, I'm not doing enough. There's all these wonderful people around me. There's Mitch, there's Meredith, there's Jimmy. I forgot your name, so I'm Christina. Uh, there's me, there's Christopher, there's, yeah, I can name everyone, Willow, Arthur, I don't care. Uh, and they're all doing amazing stuff. And then I'm looking at, oh, what have I done this year? It's like, it doesn't feel like I achieved anything. And then I hear from people, like I hear from him that, no, you're doing a whole lot. You're, you're doing a lot and people love you for it. And it's like this, this disbelief that, that I was struggling with that, that yeah, uh, I said, uh, I'm a jack of all trades and a master of absolutely none, yeah. right? And these things, like talk to people, find context for the spot that you're in in that very moment. 
and reach out, like talk to people about you, like everyone cares. This year, I've left where I was immediately, dropped everything to help someone nine times, nine times this year, five different people, nine times. There's a lot of messed up people that are so fucking wonderful that I would not want to do something stupid ever because they're helping everyone around them so much. Like every single one of them has so much going for them. And personally, at Metala, we had a case where probably one of the most talented people that ever showed up. He co-founded the Austrian Pirate Party. He influenced the Pirate Party movement quite fundamentally, bringing it from just a single issue party to, hey, we need to think about a lot more privacy, data retention. He co-founded the Graffiti Research Lab. He co-founded several other startups that then turned out to be quite successful. And everyone around him was like, just like realizing, oh my God, this is an amazing person. And yeah, in 2009, two years ago, 16th of December, he out of the blue took his own life. And it's something that Mitalab has been struggling with as a community since then. But the wonderful thing that, that brought it, brought it, that everyone realizes that, hey, we're, we're people. And we care about each other. When something is wrong, like everyone is more and more, far more sensitive. And so, yeah, I would, I would ask everyone, like in this community, we really care about doing amazing, amazing stuff. But it's not only the doing, it's also the people themselves that we care about and that we need to admit that we do that. Um, let, me, let me just uh, step in for a short second. Um, as you are aware, there's a talk uh, beginning at the full hour. I want to give you guys as much time as, as you need for this very important topic. So I, let, let's say another 10 minutes, but we absolutely need the other 10 to set up the room for the next talk. Is that okay yeah. with you? Yeah, for sure. I was Thank just going to wrap up. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, I think the, the thing is, you know, this uh, community of ours is one of the more amazing ones on the entire planet, which isn't to say that it's perfect, you know. Uh, we're all human. We all have foibles. We, uh, we all do things we're proud of. We all do things that we wish we wouldn't have done and we, we, we even hate. Um, but whatever you know and don't, or don't know, you have something to share with others. You know something that other people don't know. No matter how much you know, you uh, can learn from other people. And this is part of what makes uh, this community so amazing, is we teach and learn and share with one another. And um, even when you are feeling terrible about yourself, um, just know that you do have something that's really important to share. And um, I hope you can feel at least safe enough to talk to someone. I do, so let's make the best of it. And, um, you know, I think that's why we're all here. We're helping each other, supporting each other, and doing just that. So, uh, unfortunately, this is a topic that is a lifelong uh, kind of a topic, and we only have no minutes left. So, we can talk about, the, if we have five minutes left, okay, so, does anyone want to say anything? So, uh, This is a, a very heavy topic, and I would like to thank Mitch for bringing it up and bringing it into this environment and getting people here and talking about it. And I'd like to say that you don't have to be the wonderful person contributing amazing things to be valuable. You, sorry, uh, everybody here deserves to continue their life, and we would absolutely love to have everybody here and everybody outside and everybody in the world continuing their life. And we really want everybody to feel like they can talk about mental health issues. And you don't have to be suffering from depression to talk to your friends about depression. You don't have to be feeling suicidal to talk to your friends about suicide. If 
you notice changes in one of your friends and you're worried about them, you can ask them if they are feeling suicidal. There is no evidence to suggest that asking somebody if they are having suicidal thoughts, that they are at more risk of attempting suicide. It is quite proven that the opposite is true and just asking somebody and talking to them and letting them know that you're there for them and that there are other people, there are so many services available. It is so easy to get help if you know that you need help and anybody can go up to their friends and say, how are you going? And if they give you two answers, it's probably likely that they're not going very well and that they will want to talk about it eventually and provide as many resources as you can. Um, we have services in Australia like Beyond Blue. I'm sure there are services all over the world which are there dedicated to helping people with depression and suicidal thoughts. So get on the internet and find them so that you know where to point people when you're worried about them. You kind of touched there on you know, other mental health issues, and I just wanted to make the observation that it, one of the cool things, actually, about this community is the amazing spectrum of neurodiversity that we have. And the, I'm, I'm straight up Aspie, right? It is, it is sometimes really challenging for me to convey to a neurotypical person what it is that I'm experiencing internally, but, you know, one of the best things that ever happened to me was when I was in grad school, um, about the time that my diagnosis was shifted from a nonverbal learning disorder to Asperger's syndrome, um, I ended up with a therapist who basically said, look, I don't really understand how it is you think, but I'm going to learn the language that makes the most sense to you. This guy basically gave himself like an undergraduate computer science degree just to like help me chew on what was going on in my own brain because that was a, that was a good common language that worked. And there are people in this community that can do that too. And if, if reaching out to a person with, you know, sort of one direction of, uh, of neurodiversity doesn't result in the kind of connection that you need, try again, please, please. You know, tell, tell, tell that person, I, don't, I, feel, I feel like I'm not able to express myself right. D do you know someone who I might be able to communicate better with? I mean, ask, it's okay. The, the, the diversity of our community is its strength. And I would just like to very quickly say that um, shit gets better. It, it really does. I mean, like, they, the thing, it gets better online, it's kind of a cliche, but it's absolutely true. And if I would have ended my life when I was 16, I would not have had so many of the amazing experiences that I've had, even in the past year, with camp and Congress and all of the amazing people that I've met. Um, I still suffer from depression, and even this year I've had some major issues where I've receded for a month or two and just not talked to anybody. Um, but I eventually come back up, and things always get better. And no matter how bad it seems, as Mitch pointed out, just do fucking something. Because, um, you know, you, you have nothing else to lose at that point. And in a way, you get a lot of freedom from that and just follow what you love and you'll find an amazing life at some point, so. And there is no shame in reaching out and anybody who tries to shame you for it is a cock. Yes. There is no shame in asking for help. There is no shame in using medication. And anybody who tries to shame you for either of those things is a cock. So we have like, what, one minute left? Uh, does anyone want to say a half minute comment? Uh... Great, right at the moment when I stick a piece of bread in my mouth. <laughs> I'm one of those now people that's also, seconds. I'm one of those people that's also available to talk to anybody about anything as part of this community. And your name is? My name's uh, Michael, known as Exile Surfer online. Thanks. So uh, I think we have to vacate now. Yes, unfortunately. So uh, if, uh, if people want to continue talking, let's do it. Uh, 
out there. And, uh, w you know, it's a topic that uh, I think we're all into talking about here on this, uh, the, of those of us up here. So find us and let's talk. Um, one thing, one thing. Sorry? Um, as the Atox Signal Angel, I, um, I want to express um, the um, thanks from IRC. Um, the Arrow would want you to hug you, but uh, sadly they aren't really present. Um, and I'd suggest you join the um, channel Hackers Down on Freenode, um, where we could continue discussing this topic. Thank you, Thank you all. I also want to talk a little bit about appreciation. So thank